Anyway, I want to welcome all the people that are interested in this child care matter as well as the other 14 bills that are before us. Uh, we're going to spend a good amount of time uh, talking about the report of the legislative auditor and some comments about that, perhaps maybe up to 4.30. And then uh, we'll start in on our bills. And uh, we have a good number of bills, I think 14. I have some imagination we'll take maybe a half hour break somewhere when it makes sense. See how time goes. Um, the the other body spent like eight hours doing 22 bills, which we managed to get through 10 bills in two hours on on Monday. So thank you for that. Um, since uh, a good number of people are paying attention, I want to raise one unrelated point to the auditor. Um, in uh, online and uh, in your packets, uh, you'll see the new updated um, Department of Human Services spending the 10-year. Uh, summary both uh, regular general fund and all funds. It is uh, fascinating, um, if that's one word, to see uh, how much money we spend on programs that uh, we think are important. Part of today's hearing is to uh, express our chagrin at spending our money on programs that aren't what we thought they might be, and uh, we're totally intolerant of that. Um, and so, but just for your enlightenment to see what spending goes on. And just for the people who think that there's a billion dollar surplus, just to repeat, um, actually we have $11 million deficit in the state budget in terms of structural spending. That means uh, whatever spending we want to do is based on a minus $11 million starting point. Uh, the governor has found ways through the gas tax, the provider tax, and a very robust tax. Um, uh, conformity to get about $2 billion to spend on various things. Um, people shouldn't be surprised in the audience and at this table that that's, those are money sources we're not very excited to adopt. And so there's going to be quite a robust dialogue, um, which is a polite way to say no, um, a very robust dialogue about how we're going to solve the state's budgetary issues. So uh, just to remind people going forward, uh, it's going to be a quite interesting next two months. And uh, so today the plan is on the auditor's report, uh, they're going to present for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so. And then we'll have the department come up and have two testifiers there. We'll then uh, do, uh, oh, whatever. Um, anyway, so, and then we'll have dialogue between the legislative auditor crew and uh, the department and uh, members of this uh, panel up here. So welcome, to, and so, and uh, if, uh, if, you, if you're interested in uh, writing a note to one of the members up here, uh, we do have pages that are standing by. I see a lot of you are maybe have not been here a lot, but we're, uh, that would be the way you communicate with a, a member at the table up here. And uh, they'll be uh, kind of watching for you over there. So um, if you stand by that post, then they would take your note to one of us. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Nobles, and uh, thank you for your work, and I'm looking forward to hearing your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jim Nobles. I'm the legislative auditor, and with me at the table is Elizabeth Stowicki, who is the legal counsel for the Office of the Legislative Auditor. And as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, we are here to talk about our report concerning allegations that were raised about the Minnesota Child Care Assistance Program. And I'm sure that you remember in this committee, because these allegations were presented to you, they emerged uh, in May of last year First, in stories that were carried by KMSP television, they carried several stories uh, about the issue, and in one of those, they interviewed Scott Stillman, who was a former, is a former uh, employee of the Minnesota Department of Human Services. He was the manager of the department's forensic uh, computer lab, and he extracted information, data from computers, other electronic devices, as the department was conducting various kinds of investigations, including investigations of alleged CCAP fraud. So he had direct knowledge of some of the issues that he uh, talked about. So let's just recall what were the allegations in the news stories and from the testimony of Mr. Stillman, who made his testimony before this committee and then later before a House committee. It was alleged that the Minnesota CCAP program experiences $100 million in fraud annually. It was also alleged that at least some of that CCAP fraud money is sent from Minnesota 
to foreign countries where it is obtained and used by terrorist organizations. In his testimony to the House Committee, uh, Mr. Stillman also alleged that, quote, a well-known politician interfered with a DHS investigation. So we're going to talk about each of these, but let me first tell you what is our overall conclusion related to the three. We believe that there are facts, and we'll talk about those facts, but there are also assumptions that get Mr. Stillman and others to the allegations, and we'll talk about both of these. So uh, we believe that some of the assumptions that get you to the allegations are reasonable. And again, we'll point those out. But we think others are questionable. So what are the facts about fraud? And I want to really emphasize this. There is no dispute that I have ever heard that there is CCAP fraud. In fact, the Minnesota legislature acknowledged that in 2013 when you adopted legislation that mandated that the Department of Human Services investigate alleged and suspected CCAP fraud. And in response, the department set up a special unit of investigators, 14 uh, that are there now, with law enforcement experience, to investigate suspected CCAP fraud. And the department does not dispute it either. And you'll hear this from Commissioner Lorry. And they're on the record over and over again, there is a problem with CCAP fraud. In fact, one of the most compelling statements that I found on this issue came from DHS, from the former DHS Inspector General, Jerry Kerber. And I think many of you knew Jerry and worked with him. And he said in his 19, in, excuse me, 2014 uh, report to the legislature, Jerry said, and I quote, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, is seriously concerned about a pattern of child care fraud activities that involves deception and exploitation. It begins with recruiting parents as child care center employees with a condition that they enroll their children in CCAP so that the center will receive public funds for its business. And then Mr. Kerber went on to say, this fraud, these fraud schemes end up exploiting four sets of victims, the children, the parents, the people who are on the CCAP waiting list, and the taxpayers. So we also gathered facts from some of the prosecutions, and there have been prosecutions of CCAP fraud. And to tell you about the facts from those prosecutions, I want to turn to Elizabeth Stowicki. Welcome to the committee. Chairman Abler and members of the committee, my name is Elizabeth Stowicki, and I worked on this review with Mr. Nobles. I should just say as a dis disclaimer in the, on the outset here, I'm getting over a cold, and my voice is not as strong as it normally is, so feel free if I start to trail off and you can't hear me, please feel free to interrupt and tell me to speak up. As Mr. Noble said, given the swirling allegations, we were trying to get a baseline of facts involving CCAP fraud, and one place we thought to start were the uh, criminal prosecutions. We want to emphasize that these prosecutions serve as a floor for fraud amounts. It's likely much more, and there are some reasons for that which we can explain later. It's important to understand also that the main way that people cheat this program is to simply overbill for the number of children authorized. There are other ways that uh, groups have defrauded CCAP, but this is, seems to be the most common. What this means then is, let's say in a month, the center cares for 25 children each day, but essentially bills the state for 40. So in total, in the past five years, prosecutors have charged at least a dozen individuals and businesses with defrauding CCAP in Minnesota. Two were in federal court and the rest were brought by county prosecutors in state court. Judges have sentenced individuals to prison time. The most was five years in a Ramsey County case. They have also ordered restitution in these cases, ranging from about $12,000 to $3.5 million, for a total of about $5.5 to $6 million. If you're interested in learning more about these cases, we provided individual summaries of these cases for you, and they're listed in Appendix A. And those are located right after the response letter from Commissioner Lori. 
Now, this is not to say that because there have been prosecutions that these are simple cases. Far from it. When we talk to numerous prosecutors and, in, and county investigators from the outset, they told us these are extremely challenging for a number of reasons and can mean the difference between whether they can pursue a case or not. Keep in mind that these prosecutions, as well as the investigations, are pretty labor intensive. And as a county prosecutor, you have to decide how to fit these cases in between everything else on the docket, including robbery, assaults, and homicides. So one of the major challenges is that proving fraud in the context of a legitimate business is more difficult on its own. If you look at something like drug trafficking, for example, Everyone knows who involved, who's involved in it. It's illegal. They intended to break the law. Centers that engage in CCAP fraud, they are doing at least a partial legitimate business, and that is that they're caring for children to at least some extent. So then a prosecutor has to choose on this, in, on this continuum. Is it sloppy bookkeeping, or is it all the way over into intentional fraud? It's no secret that in these cases of overbilling, a key source of evidence is videotape of the actual number of children going in and out of a center. Prosecutors then match up that videotape number with attendance records and billing records. Hopefully there's other evidence such as informants or employees who work at the center or parents, but that this isn't always the case. One of the things that we heard over and over again from particularly prosecutors was that the state does not require any kind of electronic attendance. All of these are done primarily on paper, which can be easily manipulated, and sometimes they're missing a lot of information. One pro prosecutor told us that it's almost comical that he would see the same pen listing attendance for children in 10 different families. So it's not reliable evidence. What's more, providers aren't required to submit them with their bills. So Mr. Chairman and members, uh, we've laid out for you the facts as we found them. And as Ms. DeWicke said, the prosecutions are challenging and there, but there have been some, but they don't get you anywhere close to $100 million annually of CCAP fraud. So again, I go back to the way we framed uh, this presentation in our report. We found some facts that didn't get us to the allegation. So there must be some assumptions that have been made by people who have made those allegations that there's $100 million in fraud. And so the first person we went to to find uh, what those assumptions are was Mr. Stillman. I have to tell you, Mr. Stillman was not a cooperative witness with us. Even though he appeared before this committee, he would not respond to our request to come in. That is very odd for a whistleblower. We deal with whistleblowers a lot, and usually they're at our door wanting us to interview them, wanting to provide us with information and documents. We had to subpoena uh, Mr. Stillman uh, that's one of the reasons it took us until now to finish our work, because we could not find Mr. Stillman. We then identified that he was going to be at a House hearing, and so we presented him at that hearing with a subpoena. When we interviewed him, and we interviewed him under oath, he did not have the assumptions to fill in from the facts. He told us that we would need to find those at DHS from the investigators, and so that's where we went. We went to the chief investigator, a man named Jay Swanson, and we asked him to write us his perspective on CCAP fraud. And he did, and it's in the report. It's the Appendix B. So entirely what Mr. Swanson wrote to us, you can read. So essentially what did he tell us in that document? He told us that he and his investigators believe that there are 100 centers, child care centers, that are so deficient in their billing practices, so suspect in their practices, in fact, that he believes that those characteristics, plus others, such as the quality of care that they provide, 
characterizes in his mind those hundred centers as fraudulent centers. And he believes that all of the money that they receive, not just the money that could be determined to be fraud, but all of the money they receive is fraudulent. That the state paying them to provide child care ser services should not, in fact, occur. And that's how Mr. Stillman and Mr. Swanson get to the $100 million. So we thought it was important for you to be able to read for yourselves. What are those assumptions? And they're there, I might say, and this is important, by the man who has been there for several years as the chief investigator of CCAP fraud in the Department of Human Services. So you heard the allegations from a former employee of the department. You're hearing it now and seeing it now from the man who is in charge of the CCAP fraud investigative unit. So uh, how did the Department of Human Services respond, not only to Mr. Stillman, but to Mr. Swanson? And again, we asked Mr. Swanson to write us the email that he presented to us and that you now have in our report. They did not respond well. They do not believe, and have said so, that either Mr. Stillman's allegations or Mr. Swanson's corroboration of those allegations is credible. And uh, the department, in response to the Swanson email, hired an outside consultant to review Mr. Swanson's email and the work of his office. And I think they're going to be presenting uh, the report uh, that resulted from that consultant to you today. So you've heard the facts, you've heard the assumptions. What is OLA's assessment? OLA's assessment is that we agree that it is a reasonable assumption that there is more fraud in the CCAP program than has been proven in court cases. And it's because of what you heard from Ms. Stowicki. It's very hard to investigate and prosecute the fraud. And so we believe it is a reasonable assumption to say that there is more fraud than has been proven in prosecutions. But we could not find hard evidence to substantiate that it's at the $100 million level. In fact, we could not really find or establish ourselves what we considered a reasonable, credible estimate. Now, that leaves you in a very difficult situation because you have the head of the CCAP investigative unit saying to you, he believes Mr. Stillman, he believes it's around $100 million. The department says that's not even credible. And we're telling you we can't give you what we think is a reasonable and credible estimate either. I think that puts us all in a very difficult position. And so I think the department is going to need to work with you, work with its investigators, work within the OIG's office to try to come up with what we can all accept is a rigorously established estimate of fraud. That is something that actually the federal government expects states to do when they send money to the states to assess the risks, to estimate the level of fraud and improper payments, and establish controls in response. So let me now move to the allegation that some of this CCAP fraud money ends up in the hands of terrorists. So again, because we've been a little bit away from that allegation, let me restate it. The allegation is that CCAP fraud money sent by individuals in Minnesota has been obtained and used by terrorist organizations in foreign countries. Again, what are the facts? The facts are that you can read many federal law enforcement reports that say that terrorists in foreign countries, and specifically in Somalia, obtain and use money transferred from the United States to foreign countries, again, including Somalia. It is also a fact, undisputed, that there are many individuals in Minnesota with connections and family in Somalia that send money there. They send it as remittances, that's the term typically used to uh, aid their families. It's a poor country, and many people in this country who are here uh, send money as remittances. They engage in money transfers in a variety of ways. They send them by wire. They send them in cash. 
So that is a fact. It is also a fact that there are people in Minnesota who have been convicted of providing material to support to terrorist organizations, including in Somalia. And again, I'd like to turn to Mr. Wiki to talk about those prosecutions. Well, as you may know, Minnesota has had many terrorism-related um, cases, I mean, prosecutions. There have been at least two dozen, and I think it's more like 30, 32, 33, where the U.S. Attorney's Office has charged individuals with providing material support to a designated terrorist organization. I looked at these cases to see if there was any mention of CCAP fraud money involved, and there was not. The U.S. Attorney's Office confirmed this to us as well. Now, there was one case of providing material support to terrorists that included Department of Education money in the form of financial aid. But again, we could find no evidence that CCAP money was involved in any of the cases of providing material support to terrorism. So again, how do you then get to the allegation? Well. You heard from Mr. Stillman that he has seen wires going overseas from CCAP centers. He has seen um, money transfers of various kinds, and he was involved in those investigations. You heard on the KMSP report that there is money put in suitcases and sent overseas and that some of that money ends up in Somalia and some of that money may end up in the hands of terrorists. So that is the assumption that gets you to the allegation. So again, what did OLA find? What is our assessment? We did not find evidence, hard evidence, to substantiate this allegation. And again, this is a very specific allegation that CCAP fraud money has been sent from Minnesota to a foreign country and that it ends up in the hands of a terrorist organization. That is a very difficult thing to prove. So we cannot say definitively whether it's happening or not. We did talk to a lot of investigators involved in looking at this issue. We talked to, by the way, over, I think it was 39, 40 different prosecutors, investigators, people at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. And as Mr. Wiki said, we always ask them, have you found a connection in the prosecutions, in the investigations, between CCAP fraud money and a connection to a terrorist organization? And we were told no. And we had many, we had many interviews with investigators from the federal level who look at this thing all the time. So again, we cannot say definitively that it has occurred, but I would not sit here and tell you that we can definitively say that it has not. I would also say that, you know, we're focused on fraud here and we're talking about terrorism. And the state can do a lot about the fraud issue and you're gonna hear what we think you need to do. But there isn't frankly a lot that you can do about any money going to fund terrorism in a foreign country. But I can tell you from reading a lot of federal investigative reports talking to a lot of federal investigators, they have a very strong presence in tracking money transfers, money laundering, whether it's going to drug cartels or to terrorist organizations. So I think it's of great concern to all of us that that could be occurring, but I can tell you that from what we found, there are federal officials that are looking at this and investigating and willing to prosecute it if they find that evidence. So we've presented you with some pretty serious issues about fraud that you can do something about. So what did, what did we find in terms of recommendations of what you ought to do? Well, first of all, we went again to the investigators who were looking at CCAP fraud every day. And we looked at and we talked to the prosecutors who were attempting to prosecute it. And so we asked them, what is their perspective? Interestingly, both the investigators and the prosecutors said, you will not solve this problem by investigations and prosecutions alone. You need to be more stringent in the controls over who gets licensed, and you need to have more monitoring of CCAP centers. You need to get ahead of the problem. You need to do something up front 
because we cannot always find the fraud. We cannot always prosecute the fraud. And so what is being presented to you by Mr. Swanson, and again, he is the manager of the CCAP Fraud Investigative Unit. This is what he told us. Investigators in this unit do not believe that any real progress has been made regarding CCAP fraud. And he's been there for a number of years. And he comes to work every day with his investigators to address this issue. And he's telling you, we've had some serious investigations. We've had some success in prosecutions. But don't expect us to solve this problem. We, the investigators, believe that the current internal controls and statutes are not stringent enough to make reasonable progress in reducing the level of fraud in this program. Investigators believe that dramatic actions on several fronts, both legislative and at the department level in policy, are needed to make progress in this area. I want to mention uh, a couple of other things that came up during our review. First of all, we found a very serious lack of trust in the Department of uh, Human Services between the IG and management of the department and the CCAP investigators. It's one of the reasons why they brought in an outside investigator. But it really started earlier. The investigators told us, and we interviewed all of them under oath individually, they told us that things changed dramatically when Jerry Kerber left and Catherine, uh, Catherine Hamm became the IG, the Inspector General, that she really was not that interested in their work, that she only became interested once there was a controversy. And then when there was a controversy, they feel they brought in an outside investigator uh, to essentially discredit the work of the investigative unit. That is their belief. I'm not saying that is something that we were able to substantiate, but I'm telling you, that 14 investigators came to us individually under oath and said that. We also believe that you need to take a look at the independence of the Inspector General. That office was established by the department and they, should deserve, and they deserve credit for doing that. But there is no independent statutory authority for the Inspector General in the Department of, of uh, Human Services. I think that that kind of function deserves and needs some independence. You have certainly provided that level of independence to the legislative auditor. You provide the legislative auditor with a six-year term. Uh, I have the independence to issue this report to you without any interference from anybody. The first time the Legislative Audit Commission saw it is when you saw it and the public saw it. This is our report. These are our findings. These are our opinions and conclusions. I don't believe the Inspector General necessarily has that same level of independence to issue an independent report on fraud, and I think you ought to take a look at that. I close with uh, the allegation that was made by Mr. Stillman in the House hearing. Mr. Stillman said that there was, quote, a well-known politician who interfered with a DHS investigation. That is not true. Mr. Stillman spoke from facts he knew and as I said, there are facts, and then he made some assumptions. And the assumptions he made are incorrect. Mr. Stillman did work on an investigation at DHS of fraud. It was not a CCAP fraud issue, it was an MA fraud. And when he went on a search, with a search warrant with other uh, law enforcement, he went into a psychiatrist's office who was accused of defrauding the state of, of uh, MA funds. And when they were in the psychiatrist's office, they noticed on his desk that there were brochures related to the Lori Swanson campaign. The attorney general's office, the investigators who were a part of that investigation said, seeing those, we cannot proceed. And when Mr. Stillman presented them with the information and data that he had extracted from the computers and other devices that they obtained in that search warrant, the Attorney General's investigator said, Mr. Swanson, excuse me, Mr. Stillman, we cannot accept that evidence because there's a conflict. This person that is being investigated is a contributor to the Attorney General's campaign. That's where he left it, but that's not the whole story. The Attorney General's office 
recognized that there was this conflict and they turned the case over to the Ramsey County attorney. The Ramsey County attorney proceeded with the investigation and reached a sizable uh, settlement uh, with the fraud that this individual had perpetrated. He paid the state $275,000. As part of that settlement, he lost his license. He is no longer in practice. So Mr. Stillman spoke from what he knew, but he didn't know the whole story. And so we thought it was important to bring out the rest of the story to you and others. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation. We'd either uh, stand for questions now, or if you'd like to hear from the department, we'll come back. I think we'll hear from the department, and so uh, you could stand down, and so it's Commissioner Laurie and Mr. Johnson, and so we wanted to hear at least the response. And uh, I don't know if we've run out of them, but there were, I think, 100 copies of the report here, and to the public and whoever. Uh, this is available online, and uh, especially interesting is uh, as you read the um, appendix with uh, Mr. Swanson email, that's... Uh, Quite interesting. So anyway, uh, Commissioner Laurie, and uh, we're going to have your comments, and then uh, Mr. Johnson, and so welcome to the committee. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am uh, Tony Laurie. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services, and I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come and provide our response to the OLA uh, report released today to the legislature, and uh, thank the OLA for uh, their professionalism and their work with our agency as they look into this um, serious issue um, for us. Before I begin, I want to stress the department's commitment to assuring the state's child care assistance program, CCAP, meets the needs of the children, the families, and the communities all across this state that it is designed to serve. CCAP provides critical support to families with low incomes so that parents can work or pursue education and their children can receive safe, quality, appropriate care in our really high quality child care providers all across this state. We at the department take the state's investments in children and families very seriously and understand that program integrity in CCAP is absolutely crucial to ensuring program resources are going to those most in need. And I need to stress, this is something that every state in the country is actually struggling with. Minnesota is not alone here. Um, and we have serious issues, we take them seriously, and any instance of fraud in CCAP or other public programs is unacceptable to our department. This is one of the reasons that the department took steps prior to the OLA's special review to hire an external consult consultant, PFM, and we released uh, that report as well today so that that is public and can be evaluated, the, the internal uh, report that we contracted that um, Auditor Nobles mentioned. Um, we did that to conduct an independent assessment of the department's current process for fraud investigations in response to the allegations last year uh, in May uh, before this committee that were twofold. One, that significant amounts of CCAP funds, over 100 million, were fraudulent. And secondly, that much of the money that was allegedly fraudulent was going to terrorist organizations overseas. You know, the first takeaway is that both of the, ex the external consultant review and that of the OLA found no credible evidence to substantiate either of these claims. They did, however, provide really valuable insights for addressing the fraud and, and very real vulnerabilities in our systems today. As the OLA and the PFM both indicate, fraud in CCAP is a very complex problem, and we at the department are committed to fixing it. In addition to hiring uh, PFM, the department has been working to address fraud in CCAP for quite some time in conjunction with the legislature. Um, I was over there with, with, uh, with you guys as we developed a lot of this. Um, in 2014, uh, the CCAP Fraud Investigation Unit was created. Um, we, uh, the department has advocated for state investments and changes in state laws in support of efforts to investigate and eliminate fraud. We uh, are developing internal policies today focused on fraud investigations by engaging our continuous improvement team to work with the CCAP investigations unit. Uh, members might remember this continuous improvement team is the one that was deployed to the Department of Health last year when the Department of Health was struggling with the processes behind the Office of Health Facility Complaints and really uh, did a good job of writing that ship. We have that same team working to understand what's going on in ROIG 
strategy in our, in our investigations unit and working to, to, to right that ship as well. We are working to better diversify the skill set in CCAP investigations unit, including hiring staff with expertise in financial investigations as, and uh, forensic accountants as well. Also, we, uh, uh, Auditor Nobles mentioned uh, a, an electronic billing system is one of the key tools that other states have used to really enhance program integrity and fill in, uh, eliminate some of the vulnerabilities. We issued an RFP late last year, RFI rather, request for information late last year to find out what those systems look like for other states, how they've been received within the provider and, and the, and the um, families that they serve. Uh, make sure that we ha take a good look at what uh, is available out there. We think that that um, attendance piece is one of the very real vulnerabilities that we need to address and take a look at uh, approaching it through an electronic attendance system that would later be um, hooked up to the billing system um, as well. So the findings in the PFM report show uh, we still have a great deal of work to do at DHS to improve the internal controls and integrity of our CCAP and our investigation processes. One of the key recommendations from PFM is that we need to improve the use of data analytics. This will help us be more proactive and data-driven in our approaches to investigating fraud and monitoring, as well as communication trends and ensuring consistency in how decisions are made. It will also provide much greater assurances that investigations are based on valid and objective data, limiting the potential influence of any implicit bias in decisions. It's very important to stress that we at the department cannot do it alone. Addressing and achieving greater program integrity in child care as well as all of our programs requires a greater state investment and partnership with stakeholders, including the legislature, the counties that are our partners in, 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 uh, in uh, rolling out this program, as well as the, the, um, the, the providers themselves and, and the families that we serve. The counties as a critical partner moving forward, it's really important that we engage them and the communities that we serve uh, as we try to improve this process and improve uh, greater program integrity. Several parts of the governor's budget uh, this session are aimed at moving the department forward on many of these recommendations. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy uh, Commissioner Johnson to walk through these integrity proposals, but I think before I do that, that it's really important that in this discussion we again don't lose the sight of the importance of the CCAP program and that fraud and mis misuse takes away from Minnesotans and from the many families that are indeed eligible for this program. For most families, child care is a basic necessity and without that assistance, fathers and mothers would not be able to go back to school or seek work. And without that, they have little or no opportunity to meaningfully improve their economic situation. In Minnesota today, 30,000 children and 13,000 families rely on this important program and we still have 2,000 additional families on the waiting list. Ensuring that this program is running effectively is essential to the well-being of all Minnesota families and I am committed to working in conjunction uh, with the legislature as is everyone at our department. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Johnson to go over some of the more specific areas that are addressed in the governor's uh, gut, uh, budget proposal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. So you're gonna talk about oh, some of your responses. Okay, great, go ahead, it's your time to testify. Uh, you thank wish. you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Chuck Johnson. I serve as Deputy Commissioner of Operations at the Department of Human Services. As Commissioner Laurie mentioned, the governor's budget, the governor's legislative proposals have a number uh, of initiatives that we put together to help us address uh, the fraud uh, issue that's been raised here uh, over the last year. Um, this includes both preventing fraud and getting ahead of what's happening, uh, as well as detecting fraud more quickly on the back end so we can prosecute it when appropriate. These proposals include enhancing attendance record keeping requirements. Uh, one of the, the gaps that we have right now is that if we go in and ask a provider for their attendance records and they don't give them to us, we've had instances where those attendant records have then shown up uh, later in a judicial setting and that's been accepted as an attendance record even though it wasn't available at the time. This requirement that in, in the change that we're proposing require that immediately upon uh, uh, our request, we would have to provide those records and they couldn't be brought back later in the process. 
clarifying that absent days and holidays must be marked when they're billed to us. This nexus of attendance and billing is one of the key places where we need to build better controls, uh, and this would help us to do that in particular. So the provider can come back later and say, oh, that child wasn't there that day because it was an absent day. It's an absent day, it should be billed to us as an absent day and not billed to us as if the child was there. And this change would help with that. Establishing a uniform method for calculating overpayments. This is a very complex area, it serves a lot of county time. This would set a clear standard as to how overpayments are calculated, which would make it easier for counties to take some of the burden off of them. But it would also make it clear when we're in a judicial setting, whether it's administrative or whether it's on the criminal side, how that calculation was made because it would be laid out clearly in law. Establishing a penalty if providers fail to follow attendance reporting requirements. This puts providers on notice um, that if they're making mistakes, uh, that that is something we have our eyes on. This in particular is um, when there's a reduction in attendance and that hasn't been reported to us as it's supposed to under law. Shortening retroactive eligibility from six months to three months, which will help shorten that period of time during which a provider can come back later with additional billings um, that again, um, really affect the integrity of the program. Also funding, as the commissioner mentioned, for a case tracking system for the CCAP uh, fraud investigations unit. This will help them to better manage the cases within the unit, give us better data about the work that's being done on our investigations. And then finally, funding to increase fraud prevention grants to counties. These are grants that counties use uh, to support our fraud efforts across CCAP and a number of other programs as well. In addition, legislation proposed by Governor Walls would make it easier for the OIG to investigate and take action on fraud more quickly. That includes clarif clarifying the OIG's ability to share information on open investigations with law enforcement so that our investigations can move more quickly and seamlessly when we're working with law enforcement on the criminal uh, type investigation. Defining the disqualification process and the periods for disqualification uh, within the CCAP program for intentional program violations. Establishing preponderance of evidence as a standard in civil or administrative uh, hearings. This has been an issue. The current standard is clear and convincing. It's a high standard. We've had cases we've not been able to get through for uh, adjudicated overpayment uh, on the administrative side. Um, the preponderance of evidence is the same standard we use for our Medicaid fraud. We think it should be the same standard we're using in CCAP as well. And then finally making uh, payment or receipt of a kickback, a crime within our programs, uh, which doesn't currently exist in law and is clearly one of the schemes that we see happening quite a bit um, within the child care fraud area. Uh, also, as the commissioner mentioned, there's a number of initiatives that we've begun or that we are open to additional conversation around coming out of the recommendations from the PFM report, the consultant that we hired uh, to work with us. One of those, as the commissioner mentioned, is a con continuous improvement process that's going on right now with our continuous improvement team working with the fraud investigation unit, uh, particularly focused around data and how we use data, what data we collect, how we organize it, how it helps drive our decisions. We're making good decisions about when to take an investigation, what to investigate investigate, what to take on a criminal path versus an administrative path. Uh, additionally, um, as uh, the commissioner mentioned, uh, PFM recommended that we uh, move to an electronic attendance system. Uh, we put out the RFI. We have some information on that. That's a longer term probably prospect for us. Uh, to do some more exploration around that. We would need to work with stakeholders around it. But that whole issue of attendance, particularly attendance as it's connected with billing, as I said, is a really important part of how we address need to address controls within this program. Uh, and we think that an attendance system that's, a that's attached to billing would really help with um, closing some of those areas where we don't have good controls right now. PFM also recommended that we centralize uh, certain processes within the CCAP program right now that are done by counties and to be done instead by the state, state, particularly the registration process for CCAP providers and the enrollment as an MEC squared biller. MEC squared is a system we use for billing uh, and managing the CCAP program. So there's again, we need to engage with the counties, with the tribes, with uh, the providers around those issues, but we think that that's an interesting recommendation and again would give us better oversight and consistency in some of these key policy areas. And we're interested in working with you as we move through this session uh, and forward on how those ideas might be brought to fruition. 
Uh, as Commissioner Lori stated, we have a lot of work to do. Um, there were a lot of issues raised here, um, raised in this report, uh, raised by our investigators, as well as raised by the PFM report that we uh, brought um, forward, uh, that we contracted with, uh, about oversight of the program of good controls within the program. So again, thanks for the opportunity to be here and to comment on the report today. Thank you very much. And so if the auditors if you want to come back up, you can just kind of slide over there. We'll have all four of you at the table, and maybe you can share the middle <laughs> mic or something. So, All right. Well, there's a lot to digest here. Uh, I have a few thoughts, and then we'll uh, stand for questions. Um, once you get settled, have we got the right mug there? Yeah. Uh, to the uh, thank you for the, the four testifiers today that it, that to the um, OLA and the staff and the department. Um, I've had the privilege to serve here for, in some role, for 21 years, and we have been trying to chase down fraud since day one. And um, I, uh, we kind of relied on, I'm, as I have to admit, Commissioner in particular, I had a, it was brief yesterday, I have sat through some stuff today, we had a meeting, and I'm reading more and more of it, and I'm trying to avoid being angry, and I'm, I'm, it's talking to some of my constituents who are out here. And there's, there's a sentence you said, and Senator, Commissioner, I, I count you a friend, and so this is not about you, but you said something, we can't do it alone. We thought you were doing it. You know, we hired an inspector general. We, we have investigators in your office. We have people across the state who we thought that it was all watching, that you were watching and that you were on top of things. When I read Mr. Swanson's email, which is, has enough veracity to be allowed to be released, um, it's really not a very complimentary email. It doesn't say that all is well, and it does not say that the money is carefully spent. Today I passed out, I don't know where I put it, um, the, the all funds spending of our department here, the, the work that we oversee, at least part of it here, probably half of it, and the all funds spending and this biennium is $35 billion. And 14 comes from state money, and 18 billion comes from the feds, and 2 billion comes from miscellaneous places. Um, and, but it all comes out of the pockets of the people in the audience. And to do worthy things, we debate the worthiness of the things. We debate programs, how to serve, how to look for people that can't get out of bed, but they have help. How to help people be successful in their economics. How to help people come in as new immigrants and be welcomed and embraced into our country and, and be made into uh, successful citizens and, and on and on and on and taking people off the streets that are horrible sex offenders and, and all of that. Um, and so, frankly, Commission, there's nobody I would wish rather to have be there looking after this than you at this point. You sat in these chairs, you sat in this chair, and you sat around your restaurants in your district with people that can barely hang on with their farms. And they dutifully pay their taxes. And they trust that you're looking after it. My people trust I'm looking after it. And so uh, we are here to be a partner with you. And I'm happy you related a few topics about that you're working on. Um, but I, I thought there was more going on at the central office to look after this. And I, that's the part that surprises me the most. I'm, and, and so, um, anyway, uh, so just to recap all of this, there was assertions on TV that we heard last spring, and I thought, well, we better listen to this. We brought the fellow forward. I wish, you, and they were compelling. I'm happy that there's no suitcases of cash going from child care centers over. I never thought there were. That just, and I know Somalia has a very weak uh, bank system, and if you want to buy a $2 million building, you've got to bring $2 million in cash. And I'm really pleased, at least there's no evidence of that. Um, I'm, I, I think Mr. Nobles told me privately there was $71 million over a decade that was fraudulent, and some 7% number that seemed to be the number, if I'm correct about that. Is that right, Mr. Nobles? Is that, do I remember that number right? The prosecutions, uh, five, five to six, million dollars over five years has been proven in prosecutions. All right. That is in restitution. That's the right. restitution amount. But anyway, there's, there's a, anyway, uh, there's a, and so um, we, are, we have a relatively robust bill of integrity as well. We're going to incorporate everything we can do to make sure every penny goes to who it should. 
And um, I think with this uh, report, we're even going to be a little more pushing on that. And I, Senator Ralph has a very strong bill about how to make sure the money goes where it's supposed to in a number of, of programs. Um, and I'm concerned that there's a talk about 100 centers having poor quality. At this point, the state's job is to look over that. We're going to give the counties more chances to, to weigh in on the centers and, and, and on the, um, the quality and, and fraud if the state's not going to do something about it. But I can tell you, the people sitting behind you, Commissioner, and the people at home, they expect us to be looking after this. And so I see you as a partner, and I see us coming with a, real, with a, with a very robust bill. And, and that's strong talk for the Senate. <laughs> anyway, we're, it, just, it just simply uh, has to has to be improved and um, I think we're going to push you and so this is our third hearing on this topic and I want to thank the legislative auditor for picking up the ball and, and digging in and I'm happy that some of the assertions about Attorney General was like nothing and so we can focus on the programs and on who we're intending to serve um, so I, I, I could go but I'm going to I'll just have one more thing I wanted to say and I told you I told you Inspector General this and I told you this Commissioner, that it's my impression after 21 years of trying to dig out fraud and focus on it that the department has become somewhat lax in appearing about that and that is not okay. And I think that um, I've even talked to the state auditor. Would, would she be interested in her office to be set up as an independent agency and maybe we should attach the inspector general to that office so that there can be truly an independent voice. And so we'll flesh out these, and we talked about in the interim looking forward, and I don't know if we can put something together now, but, but I think commissioner and auditors, for the, the sake of the people we care about, those who can't get out of bed, but they have help, and the people who truly need assistance that are in critical harm, harm's way, that uh, this is a good discussion, and I, um, so um, do you want to react to that at all? And then we're gonna take questions. Well, um, Mr. Chair, th that was a lot uh, to react to, and I guess, you know, um, I did say, and I, I, I will reiterate, the department can't do this alone. You know, we have a, a framework of laws and rules and policies that we operate within, and some of those place limitations on what we're able to do. Some of those limitations were spelled out in the work of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Some of them were spelled out in the work that was done by the independent audit that we had done um, by PFM. That's where I say, you know, we need to take a good look at that, figure out what it is um, that we can do to address uh, very real vulnerabilities that we have. I think starting the conversation, I mean, one of the things that, that you said in, in, in your piece was that you brought an individual here to bring forward allegations that you didn't believe. And I recall that hearing very, very vividly, and um, you didn't even al allow for a question to be asked of this individual. I mean, I think that you know creates a set of tensions here that are greater than they need to be. I think that we are partners. The administration wants to be a partner, wants to get these internal controls built in a manner that we can ensure that every single dollar gets to eligible families and quality childcare. Um, settings all across this great state. And, you know, I think this set off a real firestorm that probably framed it in a way that isn't all that helpful to getting to a good place. Now, there, uh, uh, there are some really good things from this. Again, um, we saw in both the PFM and the OLA report um, how complex it really is to address um, the issue of fraud in these legitimate, you know, in a, in a setting that is otherwise a legitimate business. I think that um, Ms. Stewicki talked about that quite a bit. It's, it's easy to find fraud in a business designed to traffic drugs because everybody knows the intent is clear. In a, in a business that is otherwise uh, a legal business, it can be very hard to get at that intent piece and it is tricky. And uh, given how complicated families are, how hard it is to um, make sure that we are um, working with families that need to have some absent days, need to have some holidays, um, we need to get at that 
billing practice and the attendance records, be it on paper right now or uh, working to get an electronic um, attendance record over time. Uh, these are things that we can do together as partners and that, that we are putting our best foot forward to address these vulnerabilities. Um, and I, I do look forward to this conversation and I, I, I'm confident that at the end of May, we're gonna have a set of policies and proposals that working together with families, providers, the legislature, the administration, we're gonna have a better framework for moving forward and, and I pledge my part to work within our administration to make sure that we're a partner in making that happen so that the framework is there in our, in our statutes and in our rules and that I will do my part to see that the organizational structure supports in a very real way the, um, the, the work that needs to be done. Thank you, and I, uh, I appreciate that. And, and so, uh, and I guess I just want to say my opinion about, especially this item you sparked, and that's the, the, the money going overseas. Uh, it seems that there's not evidence of that, and they were unable to uncover that, and I appreciate, I wanted to say it as a sentence. Um, what this conversation has provoked is a significant amount of, of fraud going on in the child care, not, I never thought there was 40% unless you decide that really poor quality child care is fraud, and then you get to a higher number. So, so we're, I just wanted to say that in words, and uh, I admit to being the imperfect chair, Mr. Commissioner. So we uh, do the best we can, and, uh, but I think looking forward, what are we going to do? How are we gonna keep the trust uh, in our world strong? And as I said, I'm gonna reiterate again, there's nobody I wish would rather be there doing this than you, Thank you with your known integrity and your known knowledge and your commitment to what's going on. So with that, we're going to take, uh, take comments. Uh, Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Auditor and Commissioner and staff for being here. Um, I think this was an important and is an important conversation that, frankly, uh, we were having when I got in the legislature, apparently when Senator Abler got in the legislature and probably will continue to have it um, as long as there um, are opportunities for people to do these kind of things. Often people keep kind of trying to find a way in which to uh, act inappropriately. And so what I think we have is a framework here, uh, just starting with the DHS and the legislative and the, and the IG department was in response to that. Right, and now what we're saying is we need to maybe go a little further uh, and involve that group uh, into, in, into making sure as they find out new ways that people may be doing things to defraud the state, that they're growing and they're evolving and now we wanna use, we weren't talking about analytics when I started here, but now it's something that we uh, think might be a useful tool. So I think that that is a good thing and I'm glad uh, that we're thinking about it, and frankly, Senator Lori, we, we have worked together, or excuse me, Commissioner Lori, we have worked together uh, on this issue and have been uh, worried uh, about fraud as a whole. I think part of the legislative auditor's comments at the end was there was a situation in which a psychiatrist, <laughs> a psychiatrist, a doctor, right, was defrauding the state. Right, and they went in and figured it out and, and did all the things that they're supposed to do, shut them down, made them pay restitution, took their license, in front, their license from them. That's how it works. And the reason why I talked about that person is because, Sen Senator Abler, uh, we did demonize, we did insinuate that a particular subsection of subculture or culture of our community was taking money at $100 million putting it into a suitcase and taking it to the Middle East or Somalia and giving it to El Shabbat. That's what we said. We had a hearing on it. Uh, we had a, a testifier, a whistleblower, who the legislative auditor had the hound dog down <laughs> at the house to finally get him to talk. That other evidence that suggests that his conversation might be shaky, that he was extrapolating it from another person inside of DHS based on some anecdotal evidence that he's got. And then we all got up in arms with it. And then a, a particular community then had to kind of figure out what's going on and why are they just talking about us? We have members of this body, members of this committee consistently use it. 
consistently use it, use it in their, in their social media, talked about it. We actually have the media that was here in this, in, in this, in this committee hearing today that talked about it. It was poor journalism. And it was poor for us to do that. It is important that we find fraud if it's there. I, it is as important to me as anything that I do in this legislature is to do it. But it is, in, it is poor, it is reckless, and it causes great pain and great division amongst our citizens when we point out a particular group and then come back and say, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if that's what it was and I didn't mean to do it. Well, well, Senator, you did it, and it's a problem. And, and, and Senator Abler, we're friends, and we work together, but we have to, not only do we got to call out fraud, but we got to make sure that we're responsible as senators and as legislators when we make those accusations. This was a much better place to say, it looks like there's more fraud. I have worked on this issue. I've worked on the legislation that Senator Janikowski is going to bring forward about the ratio of parents to, to, uh, to uh, uh, staff, parents that are staff in these, uh, in, in these child care centers. I've worked on that. There, there, there has been, I've gotten, have had great tension from other members and members of the committee. Commissioner Lori was there to try to make sure that we do this the right way. But there is a right way to do it. I think this is an appropriate way for us to hash out, have this conversation, for us to comb through the data and figure out what is going on here and to make sure that the children and their parents are getting the resources that they need to thrive. That's what we want to do here. And if someone is doing that, if someone's taking that money and they're not doing what they're supposed to, we need to track that down if it's MA fraud, Medicaid fraud, if it's CCAP or any other program that we give here. But I do think it's unfortunate that we now sit here on this day, right, and we give a half-hearted apology to a community that has been suffering through the demonization. I'll tell you what, no one said to that white psychiatrist that took the money from us, hey, were you giving the money to the Ku Klux Klan? No one said that, right? Because cause that would be ludicrous. Uh, actually, please, uh, please sit down. Uh, please, Dee Dee, sit down, please. Okay. You know, you're all welcome to attend and to listen, uh, but you please, the decorum is that please be uh, quiet as you that listen. Was, that or was uncalled for. Uh, each person can speak as they choose. This is America. Uh, Senator Hayden. So can I. So can I. Mr. Well, Chair, I would like order in the gallery. Senator Benson, yes. So, uh, Senator Abler, um, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, thank you for having this hearing. Thank you for acknowledging and recognizing that the hearing we had last year was probably not the right setting. Thank you, staff, uh, the auditor, Senator Lori, or rep excuse me, I can't stop saying Senator Lori, I've served with him so long. Commissioner Lori, I do believe that you're the right person for the job for us to figure this out. And remember that the reason for the resources are to make sure that we are taking care of and educating some of our most vulnerable, low-income children. That's why the resource is there. And that's what I want to make sure that we get forward. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, please, just please don't applaud. Please don't speak. Please listen quietly. We're doing our best to have a very respectful conversation. We're not going to do teams of who's going to be louder or who likes somebody better. Um, this is a really serious matter, and we're treating it seriously, and we appreciate all that. So, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the, the information coming forward today. Uh, one thing I just want to clarify, because um, Mr. Noble is presented to the Legislative Audit Commission Financial Audit Subcommittee and the clarity in regards to cash, first of all, that no dollar is color-coded from where it comes from. So once things are converted to cash, uh, there is no color-coding. So as far as where it goes from there or how it's handled, um, it's just um, cash. I think the one thing uh, to realize that 
Um, this was initiated by a uh, TV news story, and it was in that TV news story um, that uh, questions were raised. We here in the legislature uh, responded to that, and in fact, through this legislative audit report, uh, through the channels that we properly have here available to us, I have a nonpartisan person who is able to uh, investigate, to look at, to review, have access to records, to subpoena if necessary, and to clear up any misinformation. And that is a legislative action that we did. We did that legislative action, and to our credit, uh, having this report here today that lays out those facts clearly. But the one thing I think we are still left with, though, is the fact that um, their own investigative unit is still saying there are 100 child care centers that the payment should be considered uh, seriously as fraudulent. We're still left with that fact, okay? And so I think what's really important here is to realize that I want to just set aside, I know there are those emotions either way, but it's really important for us as legislators to sort through that, but also, as Commissioner Lori said, staying focused on those issues that we can be responsible for, irrespective of anybody, uh, whether they're, uh, no matter what, no matter what background, no matter what, that all should have be held to the same standard. That's the most important thing. As a matter of fact, our justice system is predicated so crucially on that that we not consider whether rich or poor, we don't consider uh, nationalities or anything else, that we have a blindness that comes to that and that we have due process, that we consider that all are held to that same standard. And I think, Commissioner, uh, in going forward, what I don't want to have happen is that because of this that we recognize that, that all are held to the same standard. Wherever those uh, results may fall, that all would be held to that same standard. And I think that's really important. I know, Commissioner, that you have a real challenge. Uh, many of these things you dealt with as a senator. You sat on this side of the table and the challenges that come with that. Now you've got a new kind of challenge as a commissioner where you get to translate words into actions. We here in the legislature are ready to stand by you and with you and work to that end. That is our commitment. That is our purpose for existence. And when we are gone at the end of session, uh, this worthy work is going to fall heavily, squarely upon your shoulders and upon the governor to follow through, to carry those out in good faith uh, to, do, to accomplish those. And I appreciate your statements here today but I think it's really important that we just establish that foundation that all are held to that same standard and that we all work together. And I think that there are still issues within this report that are very serious that we have really got to deal with. And I think to lay aside both ways and to come together over the all are held to the same standard is one of the best places we can focus on as we go forward, and I appreciate any comments you would like to make or not make if you so choose. Okay, I think that was more of a statement, but there'll be lots of chances. And so um, just going forward, I've got Hoffman, Benson, Klein, uh, Isaacson, Rosen, and Ralph. And so if we could kind of play Jeopardy and like try to put it in the form of a question at some point, a few, a few comments, and oh, and then it's like Senator Hoffman, that's so unfair to you, but <laughs> go ahead, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, this conversation. And it's, um, I, I guess I want to go back and ask, when you estimate the risk, and this is to Mr. Nobles, uh, and establish controls to lessen the negative impact, I mean, these are, these are the statutory responsibilities that we have as a body. Is that correct? Mr. Nobles. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, the Senator, um, what I think I was referring to is that the federal government, uh, through the Office of Management and Budget, uh, imposes certain requirements uh, on states that receive uh, federal money. And one of those requirements is to establish a profile of the risk that you face in administering a federal program. And, and to really try to come to an understanding of not only the size, but the nature of the risk. Where are the vulnerabilities? And there has been a lot of work done, frankly, on CCAP to understand where those vulnerabilities, and I think that the commissioner just 
enumerated them as we did in our report. They start with the sign-in sheets, they start with uh, people probably being recruited uh, to bring their kids to the, to the uh, center, uh, maybe receiving some remuneration from that. So we know the vulnerabilities. I think what we need to do in the department, and there is some guidance out there from the Office of Management and Budget, from the General Accounting Office or Government Accountability Office, the GAO, uh, on what those methodologies would be. So I don't think we should be left, if we come back here in six months, a year, we should not be left with what I portray, and that is facts assumptions to the allegation. We should have facts and, and a reasonable, rigorous estimate. And I can't tell you what that is going to end up as. We, as we're comfortable saying it's going to be more than what has been prosecuted. Is it going to be 20 million a year? Is it going to be 30 million? Is it going to be 10 million? We can't say, and we're not going to speculate. But I think from the department, you ought to expect them to provide that to you. One that they can stand behind as a department so that they're not speaking with two voices, with their CCAP investigators saying it's 50%, it's and the department saying, no, that's not credible. That leaves you in an untenable position. And so that's part of the work that the department needs to do. Mr. Chair, as a follow up, thank you. And, and that, that leads to, I love your idea of the auditor perhaps, that whole thing about having a, an independent arm that needs to be looking at this makes so much sense. And, and what bothers me, Mr. Chair, is the department. And, and there's recommendations that are in this PFM report that I think we need to highlight, that the department needs to look at consistency, clarity, and comprehensiveness within their department. There is a statement in here that DHS exhibits siloed characteristics. I mean, that's no way to manage, that's no way to lead. And so what I would hope we come out of this with is that has other comments within the report that says DHS has no control over who becomes a CCAP provider, one would question who's taking the lead in all this stuff. And I would hope that Senator, excuse me, Commissioner Lori, I'm glad you're there because you got a mess to clean up. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm glad you're the right person there. Your history of advocacy and your history of working and understanding the systems approach, that's what this department needs is a systems approach. Um, and the other thing that, that comes in is the lack of trust, to, to read in this report that you have an internal lack of trust within that OIG or the, the investigator absolutely makes me sad because then it gets to this heart of the matter. There are people with disabilities who are one paycheck away from dying. They're one paycheck away from losing their house. They're one paycheck, Mr. Chair. And, and if even if it's five to six million dollars over a period of time, or it's 71 million dollars over 10 years, that money could have been used to help save somebody's life. And I would hope that we, as we look to capture savings, um, when DHS is coming to us saying we need more, we need, we need more, right? Our question back is, what are you going to do to help those that are less fortunate within the department that truly need it? Because apparently there's lacking leadership in the past that's doing there. So I'm glad Senator Lor Commissioner Lori is there to do it. And I could go on and on on program characteristics, but I think I'll be done for now and just say uh, thank you for this report. And it's sad. Thank you, Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you started out very well in saying we have to fight for every dollar in the legislature and this makes it look like there's just a bushel basket of money sitting somewhere that got handed out. And it reduces the credibility of how our government operates. These, Please. these folks who are here are angry and we get shielded from that because we have to get down to just work. And you get, and, and I don't mean shielded, I mean we have to guard our hearts against speaking in anger because we can't get our work done if we speak in anger. But the very least we can expect is competency. And we don't see competency in the Office of Inspector General. She ignored investigators who were professionals specifically targeting this area, which leads me to question what else is being ignored at the Office of Inspector General. Um, the very basic task of following up on fraud leaves us to question the competency of that office. I have a bill to separate the Office of Inspector General along with some other things and we're going to work on what that path forward looks like. Auditors must be independent in appearance and in fact. 
And if you need internal controls help so that you can prevent this internally and then inspectors outside to make sure that every dollar is spent well, then I think we can get together and figure out how to move forward. Um, Senator Hayden mentioned analytics. The last audit I did, there were analytics. That was a long time ago. And that the Office of Inspector General is just getting to it now seems like they're maybe not putting the right person in the right seat, the right people in the right seats. And so I don't want to lay everything at the foot of OIG, but there needs to be a culture change at DHS. The people who are responsible for eligibility and enrollment should be compassionate and should be thinking about how to help the people who need help and make that easier and more streamlined. But the people who are accountable need to be holding us accountable. I mean the legislature, I mean the people who ask for the money. It needs to be a complete culture change. If you are doing compassionate outreach, there should be somebody backing you up that says, okay, here's where the compassion ends because we are now outside the window of verifiable information. That you could look back a year in some cases and still have your data included should raise the hair on the back of everybody's neck who has ever participated in any sort of financial transaction. Um, so I have, I have hope that this is a pivot point and things get considerably better considerably faster than they have in the past. Um, and so I will be watchful and I will wait and see, but the folks, the people of Minnesota deserve competency um, and then faith in government can be restored. Thanks, Senator Benson. It just makes me think, and uh, we, have, we have more of the general public here than usual today, and I, I'm really glad for that. It's actually important to watch. And in our system, uh, Commissioner, we, we talk about there's a commissioner and there's an OIG, but at the top of all of it is a chief executive of the state. And at the end, the responsibility goes there, and I'm, and I, the governor, the previous governor and I had our differences, but I, figured that he was there and people run for office to be a governor, whether it be they a man or a woman, and um, they say that they are the ones to take on the tasks of that. And, and so um, elections matter, I guess, and leadership matters. And, and But I also wanted to point out by contrast, the power we have at this table is just one of the branches of government. We have to, whatever we decide to do here, we have to think of it, and then we have to find a way to write it down and the department helps us and then the other house has to agree and then the governor has to sign it. <laughs> and so just to help you understand the limitations we have and also but the, the work that we do, we actually do get to give them the money to run their offices so it's a, it's a balance but we're trying to do our job and, and so anyway, uh, Senator Klein. Well, thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner and uh, Auditor, for the presentation. Uh, so when we spoke about this issue last, uh, I expressed some disappointment with the way the subject was introduced, uh, as I think others have. Uh, and Senator Benson quite correctly reminded me, as she has again today, that fraud is incredibly important to this committee. To the extent that there is fraud and we lose a dollar in one area, uh, that's a dollar that we can't spend on things that mean a lot to a lot of us, opioid reduction and homelessness and TANF funds, and that is exactly right. I take fraud extremely seriously, and I think some of the suggestions, particularly uh, regarding the conflicts in the Inspector General's office, are very important. I thank Dr. Uh, Senator Hoffman for bringing those forward. That clearly needs to be addressed. I thought some of the suggestions that we have front-end tactics to avoid fraud rather than uh, after the fact investigations were helpful. Uh, from the department, I thought the innovative suggestions surrounding electronic attendance tracking and clarifying absent and holidays were very meaningful. And Mr. Chairman, these are discussions that we can and should be having without the introduction of unsubstantiated tales. Uh, Senator Benson pointed out that it, when we do this work, we need to shield our hearts. I can't think of a worse way to do that than by coming forward with uh, television production of a story that has several extraordinary allegations, none of which we could substantiate at the time, uh, a spy novel, really, 
which alleged that not only the dollar amount was in excess of $100 million, uh, which has not been documented, uh, but that this money was uh, confined exclusively to the Somali community and was leaving the country to uh, African nations. Uh, and, and then that it was specifically going to terrorist organizations. And then perhaps the most extravagant detail, that it was being carted in airplanes in big suitcases, I think, a detail which was only added for effect. Uh, Mr. Chair, you said, I never really thought there were suitcases. Well, Mr. Chair, why did we view that video? Why did we give that the platform of this august body and play it for the world to see? Because when I think people see that, they think that the chair and, and the governing body here do believe those allegations uh, and are putting them forward as a serious concern for the people of Minnesota. Uh, and not to mention that all of this reporting came from a gentleman whom I can only describe as a fabulist. Uh, he did not answer our questions on the day he was here. He declined to offer substantiation to the state auditor about these allegations and had to be subpoenaed to give any information at all. Uh, perhaps most distressing, Mr. Chair, is that this uh, story, unsubstantiated as it was, targeted a single community in the state of Minnesota, the Somali community, uh, and that seemed to imply that fraud is confined at least in part or a substantial part to that community. Uh, we have heard no substantiation of that claim. We've heard no evidence to back that up. Mr. Chair, if that is true, it is very important. It will allow us to target investigations more accurately. If it is false, Mr. Chair, it is even more important that we know that so that we do not stigmatize our neighbors indelibly without cause. Uh, Mr. Chair, you said that you're an imperfect chair. And I am an imperfect senator. We are all imperfect people. But for the scar that that has left with the Somali community, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that that is insufficient contrition. Thank you. Uh, senator Isaacson. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm usually the one that's blown up and throwing his arms everywhere and yelling at everybody. And in a rare moment, I'm going to play the opposite card for a second. Um, uh, while I think you've been chewed up pretty good about this, and I imagine more chewing may be coming, uh, my concern is uh, uh, much more with something that I read in the LA report that I'd like maybe the commissioner to comment on if he could. And, and mostly uh, just because I'm not sure I understand as deeply as some of the people here do, so I have a better reach of this. When the, and I might get the names wrong, the lead investigator or whatever his name was said that he thought that poor quality was akin to fraud, and that's where they got the $100 million mark uh, from. And DHS said that's not how we look at fraud. Can you comment on what the disconnect is there? And going forward, what we can expect is maybe a clearer marker of what constitutes fraud? I think I, while I am not happy about poor quality, and I want to make sure that we're providing our child care facilities everything they need to be successful, uh, I don't understand maybe where he came to fraud, and I want to know why you do or do not think that, and what we think going forward might be a standard on that if there is such a thing at this point. That's for the commissioner. Yes, please. Commissioner, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Isaacson, you know, I'd have a hard time answering that question as well. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard. Most of that came from uh, Jay Swanson's uh, email that was uh, delivered to the Office of the Legislative Auditor. I have a follow-up. And... Um, you know, I, I, he described it as um, his taking a broader view and bringing in these hundred centers. Um, to, you know, going back, and maybe I should uh, let Auditor Nobles explain this a little bit better. Um, you know, uh, the way it was framed in the, um, in the PowerPoint was there were facts and then there were allegations, and that led to the... Uh, there were facts and then assumptions that led to the allegations, and some of the assumptions were founded and some of them were not quite so founded and this one you know the hundred daycare centers that are nothing but fraud I think was one of those ones that falls in the um, uh, unfounded category mm -hmm. to tell you the truth I, I think I mean well, Senator Laurie the uh, not tied was it was not they were not fraudulent they were poor quality and the poor quality was so poor that that seemed like fraud to that that was as I as well I, I mean I guess that's mr. chair yeah, so there was an alleg... Such a bad hamburger doesn't even... You can't even call it a hamburger. I, I, 
I, okay. I can't speak to that. I okay. read the email. Um, uh, Auditor Nobles actually, I believe, um, um, uh, had him had uh, this individual under oath and questioned him, and probably has better insights than I. I, I have no more insights than what was in the report. Mr. And Mr. Chair. Senator Isaacson. And so maybe I can ask a question of the auditor, please. Sure. Um, in your looking at the investigation, any data or anything you got prior to the email that indicated that the people of poor quality, maybe the, the excuse me, I apologize, the, um, the centers that were providing such poor quality that they should be considered fraud, did any other point prior to that and anything you read by him in the investigation indicate that opinion? Or was that something he arrived at that he kind of pontificated on in the email and then going forward? Mr. Nobles. Mr. Chairman, uh, members, uh, Senator Eisenstein. Uh We interviewed uh, Mr. Swanson. Uh, we interviewed all of the investigators. And they all brought this issue up, mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, were aware of centers that they had observed, that they had visited, that they had interacted with, that they simply thought were not providing the level of care for the children that they should be. Right. Uh, I think their sense was that they're, well, this is what they said, that there are people who simply see setting up a child care center as a business, mm -hmm. as an opportunity to get public funds, and they're really not in the child care business. Right. They're just in business. And that they may have other uh, related businesses that are funded through public funds, uh, medical transportation, uh, catering, uh, personal care attendant services, and, and that, that is what troubled them that there ought to be a more stringent requirement for people to become providers of these services, that their motivation, and this is a subjective judgment they're making, but it's based on what they say they saw as the product that is being given to this community and these children, that we ought to require a higher level of service and that that ought to be a part of the licensing function, mm -hmm. not part of the investigative function. So they were stepping a little bit out of their lane mm -hmm. to raise these issues, but they said over and over again to us, we are really concerned that the services being provided to this community, which is in need of really high quality child care to achieve the purposes of the program, are not being provided that high quality uh, help, uh, child care. That so, was their opinion, that was their perspective. Senator Isaacson. So I think a, two, two, two comments on that, or quite, uh, one question and a comment. Um, uh, my question was specific. I, I, I think you make a really good point, and I don't disagree. And I think that it's unfortunate. Um, I have friends in the child care industry, and I don't like bad apples uh, casting aspersions on folks that do it for the right reasons, that really want to see the welfare of our kids and enjoy watching growth and love and all the things we want our children to experience. Um, my question, though, if I can just go back to the beginning of the question, I think I wasn't as clear as I wished I was. Would you say that they used the word fraud to describe it prior to the email, or were they just describing a situation they were unhappy with that we all agree should have been addressed better? Which one was it? Uh, let me Mr. see. Noble. Again, I, wanna, I understand your question. Did they have this view before uh, there no. was the controversy, before we asked for the email? Right. Did they yeah. put together the email? to justify a $100 million number. Okay, that's what I need to know. Second thing, if I can comment real quick, sure. is that um, <clears throat> I, I have to say that, you know, I almost said it, I caught myself. Commissioner Laurie, uh, you know, you just took the spot months ago, two months ago, not even, and, uh, and you're, you're taking on a, a dumpster fire in many ways, and I'm, I'm pleased that you're there, and I think you'll do a good job. I hope that you take the, the suggestion seriously of moving that independent investigator out of there. Um, I, I, you know, I have three kids that are five and under, and they're all in some version of what we're talking about. Well, not at this moment, but they probably just got picked up, right? And uh, I, I would be remiss to learn that one of the places I'm going to was one of these places they visited. And partly because I know the people that I deal with at these places, and these are good people that I can tell in their hearts want something good for my kids, and that's the people that I want to be child care providers, and I want to pay them for the job they do that's adequate to the service they provide, which I don't think we do right now either. 
And so uh, I'm hoping that you can find a way to look at how we start the front end process as much as the back end, because we want, and I know we're in a crunch, and I know we have some problems finding enough of them, but I, I really believe that part of the problem with that is pay, but that's a different discussion. But I hope that you'll look at that seriously, because I believe that vetting that in some way that makes sense without being too exclusionary or, or burdensome is really an important way we can maybe flesh out a couple of those people that are doing that. And that might be the quickest and easiest way to begin having an impact on the fraud issue, which clearly seems apparent. Uh, and that's, that's just my concern there. And again, uh, Chair Blair, I'm sorry I, I wasn't more ram rambunctious and verbose as I usually am. So you must be confused, even, Senator. You know what to do. Right? I know, it's so confusing, like, right? Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I even provoked a follow-up question from me, and so Mr. I Chairman, might quality... I just add one point uh, on this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, out of our work on this, we thought, what can we contribute as a next step? There's much that the department has to do, you have to do, but what can the Office of the Legislative Auditor contribute after we've issued this report? We think there is something. Uh, we propose to the Legislative Audit Commission that we be commissioned to do a rigorous evaluation of the licensing of child care centers. It will be up to the commission to decide whether that is one of our evaluations, but it is on the list. <laughs> because we think that is where a lot of these problems start and where they need to be addressed. And so we think a rigorous evaluation of the center's licensing process, the standards, the monitoring. And so that's another thing we hope to contribute, but that will be next year. Thank you, and I think you'd have my vote for that. And so just something else to look into, this this discussion about the 100 centers that have poor quality. It'd be interesting to know, given all this aware rating things, how they would stack up. And there's got to be a list there for Mr. Swans. That's just a... Mr. Or, Mr. 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 Chair. Hang on. When Mr. Nobles know, yeah. was going to respond uh, to that. Mr. Then. Chairman, I just want to be clear that uh, Mr. Swanson had a number of criteria by which he put these centers in that category of fraudulent centers. It wasn't just one, poor quality, or suspected fraud. Right. He had a lot of different criteria by which he ended up with 100 centers. I just want to be clear about that. And I, I, I just, just, no, and I was just curious as a one item, just a question, but I have a feeling that the commissioner is going to go look at some of those centers just for whatever, too. Well, so go Mr. ahead, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, I, um, I, don't, I don't have a list of what those centers are, to tell you the truth. Um, this important. was a fairly nebulous. <laughs> Um, concept and it was constructed out of a number of uh, indication, you know, indications in this individual's assessment that um, that I don't really have at my fingertips right now. I, I do think that um, we learned a lot from this audit. I do think that we have a lot of really good people trying to do good work at the department, and I need to stress that. I think the department has been much maligned here. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we have some dysfunction um, that's been called out. We have some need for more clarity and better policies and procedures. But this, you know, um, one of the things that came out in this uh, report that, 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 that troubles me is that um, we need to do a much better job of data mining and data driven evidence based um, approaches to how we identify. None of the indications were really vetted very well for how a provider wound up on this or off of this list to the best of my knowledge. Now, I will be trying to get behind this and understand it, and, and it is not an implication on any individual. I think that we need to acknowledge that too. The Continuous Improvement Project is not about laying blame at the feet of any individual. We have a lot of really talented individuals that are there for the right reasons, that are trying to do their best. We have a lot of work to do. We've acknowledged that. Um, fraud exists. I, I don't take any issue with the fact that it is something larger than um, the five to six million dollars that has been um, uh, identified in the prosecutions that we've been successful at, at um, pursuing. We have a lot of work. We have a lot of structural issues that we have to work through, um, and quality and licensing are going to be a piece of that. Um, Data-driven uh, indices that, that reduce the uh, possibility of implicit bias entering in and being a part of some of the indications is something that I need to take very seriously as well. Um, we need 
to do a lot of work. I have a tremendous public trust vested in me for as long as I hold this position, and I intend to do everything in my power to, um, you know, inspire our team to to deliver what we're able to get through the legislature in terms of the law and the framework for how we approach this. We'll uh, engage in stakeholder outreach and activity to make sure that we understand how the changes that we make will um, affect the provider community, both the center providers as well as uh, home providers. Um, and, and most importantly, the children and the families and the communities that these critical investments are designed to help. Right, and this may push back though. I mean, I'm not talking about Stillman, I'm talking about Swanson, who's your employee who has concern about 100 places. That's, I was just thinking, he's your guy. I was thought, you're gonna say, I'm gonna go talk to him. Well, what's in your mind? And I think, I have a feeling, if I was you, and I, only on a few days would I wanna be you, um, that you'd like, have a meeting with all 14 investigators going, what's going on here? men and women, what do you, I mean, that's all I'm saying. And so I, I expected the answer to be, yeah, I'm gonna go find out. That's all I was getting at. And then you're gonna discover what connects these 100 places. And gee, yeah. we better, I, I think I need another amendment to my proposal that we're sure. gonna have some more, that's all. So, so friendly, Commissioner. So Mr. Chair, yeah. I am gonna go visit some daycare centers. <laughs> and no, no, I was talking some about larger ones, some smaller ones, in, in yeah. all seriousness. Yeah. Um, and some of them will probably be centers on that list. Some of them won't be. Yeah. And I will work with the staff um, and and try to help understand it. I you know it is um, we're gonna, we're going to work on this. I, I kind of got that. So to this point, there's two, and then I have Senators Rosen, Ralph, Jensen, and Bigham. Then we're going to bring this in for a landing. So to this point, Senator Kiffmeyer, if you could be brief, and then Senator Hayden, if you can be brief. Go ahead. Thank Senator you very Kiff. much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I will be brief, but in particular to the point um, that was made here, Mr. Nobles alluded to it as regards to these 100 centers, child care centers, um, as to the characteristics. I'm going to read here from the PFM report, the report that the Department of Human Services itself commissioned to issue this report. And this is what the characteristics are. CCAP eligible center characteristics that are directly related to the occurrence of fraud. The investigations unit gathered information on specific cases that have led them to identify certain characteristics of centers that have been convicted of fraud. So they've had other ones convicted of fraud, and they saw those same characteristics in these other centers. Obviously, this would be a logical thing. What are some examples of those characteristics? Parents receiving payments from the center in return for enrolling their children in the center. This often includes paychecks that can be used to support their CCAP program eligibility. Sometimes we might call them by a different term when you get paid to enroll. Uh, centers are overbilling, billing for children on days and during time periods where they were not in attendance at the center, including holidays. Related to this, centers have falsified attendance records to match billing records. <clears throat> but the attendance records do not accurately reflect the time that children were in attendance at the center. That's another characteristic. Going on, during the course of investigations, the investigations unit has identified other characteristics directly related to the occurrence of fraud, including indications of money laundering and other factors related to bank records and the use of CCAP money that indicate intent as well as revealing that CCAP funds are not being used to effectively operate CCAP centers, which they are supposedly being paid to do. Shadow owners who are not listed on official registration, licensing, and business ownership documents. Lack of center program resources. You would expect that in a kitchen you would have kitchen supplies. This is a child care center program. There should be certain resources, including lack of staff training, lack of adequate levels of care for children, lack of food, and other characteristics of a licensed daycare facility that you would expect to see in any genuine operation. The results of these investigations, including interviews with parties who have been involved either directly or tangentially with fraud, analysis of billing and attendance records in comparison to video surveillance and detailed review of bank activity have led to a belief that there is intentional and systemic fraud and collusion being carried out by people who are involved in other illegal or fraudulent activities. 
While the individual cases have common characteristics, there is insufficient data to provide evidence of that trend because they are unable to have access to the records to document this. So that belief of the identification of certain characteristics can be used to determine they're at a high risk of being fraudulent and to estimate the percentage of CCAP funds potentially being used fraudulently. This is from the PFM report of the Department of Human Services. So it is not so nebulous, it is not vague, it is not a guess, it is not even a bias. This is factual information that leads to a uh, estimation and a, a concern that they would have that seems when you have those characteristics, that's all valid and that's factual. Mr. Chair. Uh, Please, Senator Kiffmeyer, not to the clapping. Those those are characteristics, yes, and those are characteristics that we discover once we open an investigation and we see it. They're not characteristics we can attribute to this 100 centers. And and also, uh, you at the at the very last sentence of that it says, while the individual cases have these common characteristics, there is insufficient data to provide evidence of a trend or that specific indicators can be used to identify other providers likely to engage in fraud. And that is what, ha that is what occurred to get to the 100, well, is, is a attempting to use maybe, th maybe some of these, but I mean, if we know of these things, we should be opening an investigation. I mean, these are, these are very clear in, in Disha, and we don't have these very clear in Disha on, on that 100 cases today. Senator Kiffman. Well, Mr. Chair, I think it's time to get it. <laughs> uh, we've had these questions here, and we have these questions now today, and if not you, Commissioner, this is <laughs> The agency you have, I know sometimes probably more than you may be signed up for or the realization and, and my sympathy to you in regards to that. But nonetheless, uh, you are in this position and it is your job to be able to inform the legislature and to get that information because none of us here, nobody else can do it. This is specific responsibility and duty and job that goes and, and my sympathy to you in regards to doing it. But we need to know because as Senator Benson has said and others, that the use of this money, there's, there are other needs that are important, other families that are on the waiting list. And so we need to know and have those things. And I think your own report gives plenty of information. There is more that I could have read as well. And I think that some of the legislation we have will be helpful too. But even still, right now, within your own duty and responsibility, you have authority uh, to go and uh, you have 14 investigators to go and take a look at this and um, consider that because we need to know, the people need to know. Okay, Senator Hayden, to this point. Well, thank you, um, and I will really try to be brief. Um, so, Senator Lori, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lori, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't stop it, uh, Senator. I'm probably going to call him Tony here pretty soon. But, anyways. Just call him Tony. Uh, Just call him Tony. Uh, Tony. <laughs> so, Commissioner. Um, let me ask this question. I haven't been able to read through uh, Mr. Swanson's 14-page uh, email. I've been scanning, or scanning it as we got the report. Um, so either Commissioner or uh, even uh, our legislative auditor, who, but Commissioner, I think you know this. If the if he's implying that his him and his team have gone in and to uh, daycare centers and saw things that weren't okay. Uh, the food wasn't there, uh, the, the, there's a plunger in the bathroom that wasn't supposed to be there, or there wasn't any green space or any real activity for kids, especially in our parent aware centers. Is, is there a responsibility for the, for the fraud investigator to call the licensing agency to say, hey, we just went through here looking for fraud, but what we found was um, that these kids aren't being taken care of very well. And if, and I would assume that's kind of a mandated reporter function that we have in other places when we don't see it well, it might not got to that point. But if that is the case, or even from a professional standpoint, is did they do that or did they just say, you know what, we're really super pissed off and I'm gonna just talk about it amongst my friends and then I'm gonna write a long report to give to the legislative auditor or did they actually call 
the licensor and say, there's a center at X place. We went and looking for one thing, but look at all the other things that we found. We think you should check that out. Senator Hayden, remember, these are state employees that work for DHS. These aren't county or some independent agency. Just to remind you, I these, are, exactly these, are, these are our investigators that do inspector inspections and investigations. So, Mr. Chair, to so my Senator point, Murray, go ahead. They, they do have different roles, and I'm just trying to figure out, did they, did they call the licensor to say there is a problem? We all have different roles, so if I'm going in looking for one thing, but I see another, and that's under the jurisdiction of the Listen, county or others. I mean, this department is broken. It is not working. Yeah. It's like if your LA doesn't talk to you and then, <laughs> well, were they supposed to talk to you? Well, well that's their job. Well, okay, Mr. I'll, I'll Chair, the answer, respectfully, I'm, like, I'm not, well, I, that's why I kind of asked Commissioner Lori. I just wanted to see I'm, if there was some, if, if that process <laughs> was in place and then maybe we can have the debate on what they should have, should have done. It's their job. It's Senator Lori, go ahead. Or Senator, Mr. Johnson, maybe you want to just offer us something. You haven't spoken yeah. all day, so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Hayden. Yes, the licensors sit within the same unit, the OIG, as the uh, fraud investigators. They work closely together in both directions. When licensors are at a center and see, they ask for attendance records, something licensors do. They don't get them or they don't look complete. They will go back and let the fraud investigators know. So we have built that two-way street. That's part of why the licensing and, or, and fraud piece, piece were put together into the OIG because they work in similar circles. So, Mr. Chair, just to follow up with that, the, what I'm trying to get at, Mr. Chair, without, you know, without prolonging, I know we got a lot of work yet to do today, is I'm just trying to figure out, I really am, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a defending one or the other, I'm just trying to figure out how do people work together, and this might also be for Commissioner Lori and the team to figure out how do they work better together if we're noticing that they, if one side of the, the team is in one cubicle and they're noticing something that they need to talk to the other person in the cubicle who comes in and actually does that work or if they're doing it together. When I read Mr. Swanson's report, it just it felt like they were all of these issues but they weren't being addressed. Now, I don't know if that's because they felt like they sent that information to their supervisor, if, if that's what we're suggesting, and she didn't do anything. I was just trying to get an understanding because I don't think that it is widely known. Mr. Chair, you may know, and maybe I know too. I'm trying to get teased this out so that as we give instructions via legislation or our oversight to the commissioner and others, that this is what our expectation would be. We wouldn't let that linger and fester until it just turned into something that they would actually get on that and deal with that whoever's responsibility it was. Well, and I think that's the whole point of why we're here. I, how do they work together? Badly. And maybe a commissioner and Mr. Johnson, if you could just for Monday get us the org chart of the OIG's office because we really don't know how they work and it sounds like the net thing isn't all that good and so you're we'll, at this point working on that. So We'll get you the org chart, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator Hoffman to this point. And then Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Absolutely to this point on page 19 of the report that you had authorized a, a third party to come in. It, it gets to the heart of the matter that Senator Hayden and Senator Abler and, and yes, excuse me, Commissioner Lori, once a senator, always a senator. That's what, that's what it's told. So, you know, it's going to be that. But I guess as a follow-up, it, it specifically says that, that DHS has siloed characteristics. The last sentence really gets to me. There seems to be not a lot of coordination between fraud investigators and the program staff in this area. And as you're talking about what Senator Hayden and Senator Abler were discussing, I guess specifically, what are you going to do to assure that there's consistency in collaboration, coordination, and... Um, I don't know, comprehension, you know, within within the department, because I mean that is a that should be just an accepted standard. And 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 if you've heard now from elected officials saying this, I mean I I am again just another elected official. But the recommendations that I'm reading that your third party is saying, I think get to the point. But really, how are you going to exercise to get people to start? to communicating and collaborating. And, and, and I, don't, I guess what I'm looking for is, you know, we're going to go back and we're going to make these changes versus we're going to have a task force, we're going to pilot this, we're going to do that. And it's just, uh, um, you know, it's been around the system as long, systems as long as I have been. When I see stuff like that, that's a fractured department. And so, again, Senator Lori, I'm so glad you're there because you got a mess and, and, and you should be know that I want to be here to help you clean that mess up. So thank you. 
guess that's mostly a statement. So, Senator Rell, was there a question there? Do you want to respond? To, so, uh, so you, you tried to respond, but I guess we're looking for like, what are you going to? You're going to go visit some daycare centers, and um, but so. I got to think you're going to look internally and go like, holy. We're cow. going to look internally. We have the Office of Continuous Improvement working on getting behind what is behind this. I should say that um, in the in in Senator Hoffman's piece, this was actually the fraud investigators and the program area. So that's over in Child and Family Services um, is the program area. So it it actually they they are um, separate areas, and we do need to make sure that they are coordinating. Um, well, in delivering a program that, that gets the services and the resources out to the families and the children and the communities that we're trying to serve and has the program integrity as a real piece of doing that work. And, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of good recommendations about how to approach that. We have the Office of Continuous Improvement helping us understand that. Again, um, this is a large and complicated task. And, you know, the solutions, you know, the, the problems don't lie at the feet of any one individual or any one silo. We need to understand and work together in a collaborative manner and have much better communication um, than, than, uh, than we seem to have right now. And Senator Lowry, actually, they're at your feet, I think, and uh, the feet of the governor as the chief executive, and we're confident about that. So, Senator Coffin, do you want to use any more C words in a sentence? Mr. Mr. Chair, no, I, I think Senator Lowry said it at the end when he said we need to work more collaboratively because the, the opening comment about, you know, just reiterates the siloed approach, which is completely wrong. It needs to be cross-core tabbed, and, and people need to be working together. That's the only way that this integrated system is ever going to work and people need to talk to one another. I think he ended his statement with that and so I, I was actually pleased by that. So, and, and just to build off your thing and then we'll get to the last three questioners. Um, this the, the TSA, when you go to the airport, there's somebody that had put something in, in a sock so they check your socks and then they don't check your gloves and so they put something in a glove and then they check your gloves. Um, I hope that you see that this is not just a child care issue and right. it, this is, you have a, a department that spends in the last, in this biennium, you're going to spend $34 billion on stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if a department that's as modest sized as this with, uh, there's just, there's stuff everywhere. And so uh, this, frankly, it shakes my confidence a bit. But for the fact that you're there and you're so knowledgeable, and I'm not, that's not a pandering comment, that's a true statement of hope. And so, uh, but I think this is, as people are watching, I think we're going to be just watching more. So we'll move on to the next question. A whole new chance for a new question, Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to be sort of the last one in the, in the chain here. Most people have stolen my thunder already. Uh, but I'm going to try, I'll try and be brief. A, a couple of observations. First of all, I know we've spent a lot of time on the discussion of we, uh, how much fraud. Was it 5 million, 6 million, 100 million? I think the key takeaway that I find from, uh, from Mr. Noble's really thorough approach here, there was fraud. And there was substantial fraud. So let's not worry about how much. Let's worry about going forward with many of the things that we've talked about today and figure out how to stop it. Mm -hmm. So I, I want us to, to, direct, to, to redirect our thinking. We know there's a problem. That, that, so let's get, let's get beyond that. Uh, the second thing I want to make a point on, and that is, is that when we do this, we have a lot of very fine, hardworking, dedicated providers out there that have many of them made it a career, especially in the home-based care provider, which are very important to our rural areas. We want to make sure that whatever program changes we make do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that, that while there's going to be some things that are not going to be real well received, that the ultimate object is to provide exactly the information that we're talking about, and that's accurate data to be able to determine exactly what's going on. This may require some reporting requirements that some people may get a little edgy about, 
But in the long run, if we, as, as, as our legislative body provides the tools to the department to be able to manage this, and then gives the, the department, and I, and I have full confidence in Senator, now Commissioner Lori, who was very good to me as a freshman on this committee, and I have to compliment him on that tremendously. I believe that he will have the compassion to be able to do this, but I think it's something we have to put in the forefront, that when we design the systems and we ask the questions that we make sure that the people that are administering that look at it first from the provider standpoint, that their job from the department should be to make that provide, give that provider the opportunity to be a better care, child care provider, and that their whole focus in inspections and in the management of these systems be to help child care providers do their job better. And they can, they do a wonderful job, and I think they need to be supported in that. So I want us to make sure that we don't lose sight of that focus. Uh, a couple of other thoughts. We've talked about fraud, what is fraud? I would like to move it into a different category. I wanna call it waste. I wanna call it money that's not going where it's supposed to go. And I don't care what caused that. If it was deliberate, then those people should be punished and if possible, sent to jail. If it was a mistake or a misunderstanding in the way that they were supposed to be reporting or submitting their requests, then I want the department to sit down with them and help them be able to do this correctly in the future and in so doing, provide more accurate data that we can look at as we go forward. So those are just some thoughts. I, 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 I've been listening to all of this and there's been a, a great deal of discussion, a lot of good ideas, and I think a lot to digest. I mean, I, my head is exploding. But I think that we have a, a, a tremendous opportunity here. I, I do want to ask one question, Mr. Nobles. Have you been asked by the other body to present this uh, information to them? Mr. Nobles. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, Senator, we, we were scheduled, uh, but uh, we learned today that uh, they have other matters to attend to, uh, so we not, are not currently not, we are not scheduled to present this to the House. Well, I, I would make a, a, just an observation that I think it would be of great benefit to the other body to have Senator Lorry, uh, Commissioner Lorry, and Mr. Nobles present this to them because I think it will stimulate more discussion and it will lead to a, I think, a clear commonality of understanding that we as legislators need to go forward to, 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 to actually reach solutions that number one, we can agree on and that we can get through and get to the governor. And that's what we need to do. We need to get things on the table that make sense and get them forward so we can go forward with this. So I, I am very optimistic in what I've seen in, in, in what Mr. Nobles has, has presented some, 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 some things that are very disturbing. But in the presentation, I also see a, a, a bright side to it, that it has begun to focus us down a path that I think we can follow and that I, th and I, and I trust that, Commissioner, you will be able to, 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 to take the football and run with it, so. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Crucial conversations, lessons learned. Senator Klein, thank you for your comments regarding the danger of legislating and making too many decisions based on anecdotal information. I think that's really important. And Senator Hayden, I certainly hear your heart and I appreciate your sharing. Senator Abler, your able leadership, pun intended, uh, has been uh, appreciated and important as you move through this process. Commissioner Laurie, you've got a big job to do. You just need to help us restore our confidence that the dollars will be stewarded wisely. Mr. Nobles, thank you for your report and thank you to your staff. But probably more important than anything I've said is to all the people who took time away from their life and came down here and wanted to participate and listen and engage, thank you. This is your, your capital and this is your state. Thank you. Thank you, and having saved the best for last, Senator Bigham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Auditor Nobles, thank you for your work and to your staff. Um, and Commissioner Lori, um, I'm not going to uh, reiterate what a lot of my colleagues have said. I, I think you're the right person for the job. You have a large task at hand here. And um, I think Chair Abler and Chair Benson's budget target just changed a little bit because uh, you're gonna need some help to be able to do this. And uh, so I think that's part of what I would expect um, from uh, the leadership of uh, the Senate. And I'm, I'm gonna um, just say that I think this report is troubling, it's sad. Um, I'm going to um, weigh in and say that I support also having some, um, having the internal auditor go over to the state auditor for some independence. I think that is a fantastic idea. But I also applaud you for your response to this report and having some uh, concrete examples of what you can do right now with your staff commissioner. And um, again, uh, I will echo what uh, Senator Jensen said is to thank everybody for, for coming today and being part of uh, this discussion because this is what it's about. And um, the responsibilities on us as collaborative efforts um, continue to resolve this. So um, I, th I thank everybody uh, for the time today to come here. All righty. Um, so I think this has been a really good discussion. And uh, looking forward, I think that uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some good things. And Senator Lori, um, we're going to be in the thick of our budgets in the next few weeks. Uh, perhaps in about three weeks, you could come back and give us a, a, just the highlights of where you've decided to go, where you plan to look. You can keep your confidentiality straight if you want, but just some general ideas. Um, I think if I summarize, uh, the more I read, the more I'm just surprised. And uh, the best thing for you, Senator Lori, is none of this is from you. So you're coming there as the new broom and uh, with an eye toward excellence and what you intend. And I uh, have watched you build programs and, and, and work on things with an eye toward service and compassion. And now it's going to be an eye toward efficiency and effectiveness. And uh, I think that's a really good mix to add that in. Um, and Senator Bigham, I don't know if that means we're going to increase our budget. I think we're going to hope that one of the answers is they're going to be people that actually talk to each other and uh, that they actually do the things that they've been designed to do and that they're free to work and to express their opinions. And in a, in a world where Mr. Swanson's thoughts seem so uh, put aside that, um, that that's, there's, there's room in there in the, in the good staff that are there. I, I know a bunch of the people who work there and I know their, their interest in doing good work. And so hopefully you can take your crew. And Senator Lori, you know the general budget is minus 11. And so, um, we have a choice. We can add people to do work that, or we can try to find way to, ways to help people who are quadriplegics get out of bed in the morning. And I'd rather put the money into that and to make sure it goes there and so would you and there's other things that are on your mind and we think about it every day. So um, do you want the last word, Senator Lori or Senator Noble? Mr. Nobles, do you want to offer one last comment or are you all talked out? Mr. Chair, I just want to thank everybody for your time and attention. Really appreciate that and I wish you well as you move forward to try to help solve these problems. And Commissioner, I'm going to give you the chance to have the last word. Well, uh, Mr. Chair and members, I want to thank you for the time and attention to this important issue and pledge that uh, the Department of Human Services is going to be a partner in making sure that every dollar that is invested, and I know how hard it is to get a dollar out of the legislature, we want it to go to eligible families, to high quality daycares, and make sure that it is delivering exactly what it is intended to do, um, which is support low income families with critical child care needs to allow parents to work and pursue their education and, and actually prepare kids to uh, approach school better ready to learn, meet educational milestones. We have a tremendous child care uh, provider community. We have tremendous uh, families and communities all across this state. We have a small number of providers who are taking advantage of some vulnerabilities. We have a set of very real and concrete proposals to reduce those vulnerabilities a great deal and identify fraud much earlier, uh, not do the pay and chase. Uh, I, you have my uh, pledge to work with you as a partner 
in seeing what I know we all share as common goals. Thank you very much. And so uh, that's the uh, thank you very much.